Hey, good evening, everybody. It's Kill Casey, your information officer here. McKinley Fire, 11 p.m. Tuesday update. You're live right here at the Willow Community Center. It's the end of our day shift, so we wanted to give you everything that we know. Our transparency campaign is on, and we also want to give everybody a big shout out who came to the community meeting in Willow and raised all the great questions. That is online right now. It's been online all day long. It's also on YouTube. We have a little bit of noise in the background there. That's the sound of the command post coming together. That's our mapping uh, our friends in mapping working on putting these big maps together. And that, that's what you're hearing in the background. I've got Tom Kurth, our deputy ensign commander, working the camera, and Stephanie Bishop, our deputy public information officer. They're fielding questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in. I want to zoom out a little bit and remind everybody about how this fire spread. Uh, this, what you're seeing here, is uh, the five-mile perimeter that grew very rapidly over the course of a couple of days. As you recall, we had a day one and then a day two type uh, event. A lot of fire movement in a very short period of time. What we sometimes worry about, all of us, is that this is just going to keep repeating itself or happen over and over. This was a very unique wind event that our incident meteorologist, Julia Ruthford, covered extremely well today at the community meeting, and she described how the airflow all across the Alaskan range pushed very dry air over the range down through our valleys at a very high speed over a very broad area. And that does not happen very often in the state of Alaska. And we don't anticipate that happening anytime in the near future in our forecast. So the rate of spread of fire we're having right now is very slow. It's that ground fire we've been talking about and that very dry duff. So folks who are seven miles down, five miles down, who are worried about, is it gonna make a huge push with 30 mile an hour winds again? We're not seeing that in any forecast that we're seeing. We are seeing some winds changing over the weekend. We are on the attack now, as opposed to being in a defensive pull firefighters away mode, which is what we have to do when the wind is blowing because the fire extreme behavior gets so extreme. And again, firefighter and public safety is the most important. So we are seeing the creeping. We did have some growth of the fire perimeter to the east here that's not showing on this map. And then the reason why we love having your questions is because it helps us remind you that not everything in this fire perimeter even burned evenly or the same. We have some homeowners along the river corridor here. We have cameras around their house who know that there's no fire around it, but it looks like it's right inside this very red shape here. And so fire burns in a, poly, uh, sorry, a mosaic type way. It, it finds pockets of available fuel and then goes around pockets that are not very available. And so as we get to the point where we can have flyover footage for you, which we will have in a number of days, you'll be able to see that there's been a, a various intensities of burning in here. Uh, the firefighters are still fully engaged in all the activities we've been talking about. Uh, midnight suns at the north end of the fire, White Mountain on the northwest side, Pioneer Peak hot shots on the south. Six more engines from Fairbanks came down today. Two are plugging in immediately on the night shift. Four will be added to the day shift. We have two additional Alaska Type 2 crews arriving. We have the Rogue River hot shots and the Warm Spring hot shots. They've actually already checked into the command post here. They've eaten dinner, they've gotten their preliminary briefing and they're bedding down for the night. They'll be inserted tomorrow. We have our engine crews still out here, and we are getting a lot of questions from folks who are asking about the egress in and out of Hidden Hills. I just want to remind everybody on this map right here, this green, which is essentially everything you're seeing here, is our go evacuation zone. So the way we do this with the ready, set, go, initially we give people a ready, and then we put them on a set, which is a yellow, and the go is We've asked you to leave your home because of either immediate fire threat or the potential of there being an issue over the course of our incident. So when folks are asking us questions about the concern over this Hidden Hills, <laughs> technically speaking, in a go, the reason why we've asked you to leave is so we don't have issues with egress in the event that something happens and that our emergency responders can work these roads as needed without having public to potentially have to go rescue, putting us at risk, putting first responders at risk. And that's that broad overview of why we have the GO system. So if you are sheltered in place and you're getting low on food, and we've had some folks call us with their concerns, please remember 
it's okay to just go ahead and evacuate whenever you get that inner sense that it's time. There's going to be a lot of fire activity in terms of fire work, crews, helicopters, mopping up. This tundra is very, very dry. It's going to take a very, very long time for the firefighters to secure all this edge that we need to secure. So if you're at home wondering if this is going to be a quick pass and you can hopefully have everything clear up in a couple days, we're just getting to the point where we're not seeing any moisture in the forecast. We know this is going to be a long duration event. We have an additional five hand crews ordered on top of the additional three that we have coming in after the ones I already told you about. So we're looking for a total of 15 hand crews on this fire in the next couple of days. That's 300 firefighters just right there, let alone the engines, the support personnel, and all the technical specialists who are out there in the field. So this is becoming a very long-term event in terms of mop-up and making sure that we can check all these fire edges as these fingers want to creep and move to the dry fuel. Some other questions that people have asked is what they can do for the firefighters. And we just want to make sure that you know that all these comments that you're, you're leaving here of, of gratitude, we try to pass on to the firefighters, but the best way you can give us a gift is have defensible space around your structure, evacuate when we ask you to, if you're really grateful, you can put up a banner that says, thank you, firefighters. That way the crews see that when they're driving up and down, patrolling or doing their mop up or leaving one area and responding to another. You can also drop off postcards with stamps and things that the firefighters who are coming more from the lower 48 now can write notes to their, their friends and family back home. If you have food donations and things like that you want to make, please don't bring those to the command post here. Please get those to the local fire departments who are staffed by volunteers year round here. And you know who those folks are, some of them are your friends and family. We do know that a couple of local volunteer firefighters were out here on the fire when their structures were impacted. So those are the folks we want you to bring donations to. We're honored to be here, we're honored to serve, we're professional firefighters. We're here to be here for you. So please give your gifts to the local fire departments. There are several new stations around. Make them know your appreciation. You can also become a volunteer firefighter, become part of the community emergency response team, join this movement of neighbors helping neighbors. We know that that's what a lot of you want to do. I'm going to turn the questions up to Tom and see if we have anything coming across. Well, I think what one question we see here is that would it be helpful for the civilians to put together a task force of equipment and firefighters and come out and assist the professionals. Okay, and that's a question we get a lot. Again, that's Alaskans want to be part of the solution. In this case, there isn't a single fire personnel on this fire who hasn't gone through an extensive amount of training, an annual Fireland refresher, a Firefighter 130, 190 course, and has had a duty officer or another supervisor verify that they're fit for duty and in our system. So this is a group of professional firefighters. The best way that you can help out is you can help a neighbor who might be uh, elderly, who might not have the equipment that you have, who might not have the friends and network that you that are coming together might have and offer support to somebody outside of the evacuation area because it's still fire season. We're definitely not out of the possibility of a human caused fire, a lightning caused fire or some other fire. So we appreciate that willingness to want to help your neighbors, but go ahead and do it outside of this level three area and maybe help somebody north or south of fire prepare. And I think the next thing you talked about internally what you might see inside this red line that's around that, but the line itself is somewhat of an estimate that was developed over the last 24 hours and it has a lot of implications because it's showing where structures may or may not be. And so why don't you talk about the right. perimeter itself. Really good point, Tom. Thanks for bringing that up. The way we get this perimeter is two ways generally. There's a field truthing when we can, but mainly it's through helicopter infrared when there's smoke impacts or the pilots can't necessarily get an idea of where the perimeter is. There is some guessing and somebody might be looking at their structure right there and thinking, oh my gosh, is the fire uh, bearing down on my house? Quite conceivably, this perimeter could be outside. The flame front on this fire really was an impact on Sunday night starting about 6 p.m. That's what did most of the damage, just like the Sockeye fire when it boiled up and moved north to south. 
down from milepost 77. That's a very similar situation here. So we try to get you accurate mapping, but again, until we have a much more specialized flight that can see through all the smoke with much more specialized equipment, this is somewhat of a guesstimate. And again, everything within it isn't necessarily burnt the same way. Okay, and I think there's just a lot of thank yous, but at this time, maybe it's best we go to bed and yeah, start we're gonna, and we're do this to, again. Tom's looking at our work rest ratio. We do work very long days. We do appreciate all of your support. Again, it means a lot to us to be here to serve this community. We're all in this together, so let's come back together tomorrow morning. We'll do another live update, and we always do look for your questions in here. We look for the themes. Uh, we know that some folks have some concerns and need some help, so don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, if you need and it's urgent, please stop by the community center and touch base with us. And thank you.